Hi everyone, this is Pastor Apostolos. It's so wonderful to see you this Sunday morning. Hope that you've all had a good week. Today we're going to continue our series on the Book of Romans. In the 1870s, the company Western Union had a monopoly on the telegraph system, which was the most advanced communication technology at the time. This made it one of America's largest and most powerful companies. The president of Western Union was a man named William Orton. In 1876, Orton was approached by a man who uh, offered to sell his company the patent to a new invention. That man was a business partner of uh, Alexander Graham Bell, who had just invented the first telephone. Alexander Bell offered to sell Western Union his uh, patent to the telephone for a sum total of 100,000 US dollars. Orton, however, thought that it was a joke. He wrote back to Alexander Bell, Mr. Bell, after careful consideration of your invention, while it is a very interesting novelty, we have come to the conclusion that it has no commercial possibilities. What use could this company make of an electrical toy? Well, the rest is history. Alexander Bell kept uh, his patent and within a few decades, his telephone company had become the largest corporation in America. And his patent to the telephone, which he had originally uh, offered to sell to Orton for a measly total of $100,000, ended up becoming the single most valuable patent in history, worth over $25 million. Within two years of turning down Bell's offer, Orton realized what a big mistake he had made. He spent millions of dollars trying to challenge Bell's patents and uh, stab, uh, building up his own telephone uh, network which eventually he was forced by the courts to hand them all over to Bell. And within a few years, uh, his company had become nothing more than a money transfer and, uh, and, and wire order business. Instead of going down in history as one of the architects of the telephone age, Orton would be remembered as the man who made the worst business decision in history, all because he failed to grasp the enormous implications of the telephone. Well, for the past few weeks, we've been hearing about the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. Have you grasped the profound implications of this good news? Do you understand? What this good news means for your life? Or are you missing out on the best deal ever because you can't see the uh, what the implications are of this good news for your life? Two weeks ago, we looked at Romans chapter 3, verse 21 to 26, perhaps the single most important paragraph in the book of Romans. There, the Apostle Paul uh, gave us the, the heart of the gospel. What is the good news of Jesus Christ? Well, the good news is that the righteousness of God has been made known to us. A righteousness that is no longer based on the law, that is, it is not uh, based on what you do, because if that was the case, none of us would be able to attain it but rather a righteousness that is apart from the law because it is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. Righteousness is no longer something that you have to uh, earn or achieve with your own effort. Rather, it is a, a, a free gift from God. And all you have to do to receive this gift is believe in His Son, Jesus Christ. 
because he has already paid the penalty of sin on your behalf uh, at the cross. This is the, the, the good news of Jesus Christ in a nutshell. But what are the implications of this good news? If it is true that we are justified by faith, uh, justification, remember, means that we are declared right with God. How does that impact our life? Well, today we're going to look at a new section in the book of Romans. Romans chapter 3, verse 27 to the end of chapter 8. And in this section of Romans, Paul will explain the implications of the gospel. Today we are going to just look at Romans chapter 3, verse 27 to 31. So if you have your Bibles with you, please take it out and turn to Romans chapter 3, verses 27 to 31. And I'm going to be reading from the NIV version. How about you read along with me as I read it? Where then is boasting? It is excluded. Because of what law? The law that requires works? No, because of the law that requires faith. For we maintain that a person is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. Or is God the God of Jews only? Is he not the God of Gentiles too? Yes, of Gentiles too. Since there is only one God who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through that same faith. Do we then nullify the law by this faith? Not at all. Rather, we uphold the law. One of the programs that I like to watch every week is the Q&A program, which screens on the ABC channel every Monday night. On this program, uh, people in the audience get to have their questions answered by a panel of politicians, uh, celebrities, academics, and other leading thinkers of the country. And in this, as you watch this program, it becomes apparent just how easy it is for people to draw different conclusions from something that has been said. You see this particularly in politics, where politicians are constantly accusing uh, members of the opposing side of saying things that they may have not necessarily said. For example, the PM uh, makes an announcement that they will be doing a review on JobKeeper, and the op opposition merely jumps onto that and uh, goes on the media saying that the government is uh, are going to scrap the JobKeeper, which may not necessarily be the case. And so the Q&A program is a great platform for politicians to clarify what they really mean and uh, to defend themselves against false accusations. Well, that is what we have in today's passage. We have a Q&A session. The style of writing here is very similar to what we saw in chapter 3 verses 1 to 8. There, Paul used a liter literary technique known as a diatribe. Do you remember what a diatribe is? A diatribe was a popular teaching method used by ancient Greek philosophers, whereby you, uh, a, a, you set up a and uh, a debate or dialogue with an imaginary opponent. Well, in today's passage, we have another diatribe. Paul uses a series of question and answers to uh, defend his teaching from false conclusions drawn by his opponents. And through these question and answers, Paul gives us four implications of the gospel. The first implication of the gospel is that it excludes boasting. It excludes boasting. Look at verse 27. Where then is boasting? It is excluded. A story is told of a, um, a woodpecker bird who was um, pecking away at a pine tree, do, 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 
when suddenly a strike of lightning from the sky split the tree from top to bottom. The woodpecker blinked. He could hardly believe his eyes. He backed off and took another long look at the tree. And then he flew away. A while later, he came back with nine other woodpeckers. And puffing up his chest in pride, he said, There it is, gentlemen, just as I said. (laughs) Pride. Pride is probably the most common and basic of all human sins, isn't it? I don't think that there is a single person who can say that they are never proud. It always amazes me just how easy and natural it is for me to boast. Whenever I accomplish something or have a bit of success, my immediate impulse is to tell the world about my achievement. I may not always say it out aloud because I want people to think that I'm humble, uh, pride again, but I think it. I have this unceasing uh, a craving for uh, people's praise and recognition. I want people to see how good I am. And instead of giving God all the credit, I often find myself taking some of the credit. No wonder medieval theologians often spoke of pride as the root of all sin, of of which no one in the world is free of. But if our salvation was all done by Jesus, it leaves no room, no room for boasting. Because we've done absolutely nothing to deserve it. We've been saved not because of our own righteousness, but because of Christ's righteousness. So we can't take any credit for it. Even the act of uh, uh, putting our faith in Jesus uh, is not something that we can take credit for, because even faith itself is a gift from God. Without God's help, through the work of the Holy Spirit, none of us would even believe in God. So, all the credit, all the glory belongs to God alone. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 to 9 says, For it is by grace you have been saved, through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. If salvation is by grace, then it excludes any boasting. Praising, not boasting, is the language of those who have been justified by faith. And this leads us nicely to the second implication of the gospel. It excludes Legalism. It excludes legalism. By legalism, I mean it is not based on keeping a set of rules, rituals, or religious practices. In verses 27 to 28, Paul answers the second question. Because of what law? The law that requires works? No, because of the law that requires faith. For we maintain that a person is justified by faith, apart from the works of the law. Here, the law doesn't refer to the law of Moses or the uh, commandments of the Old Testament, which is what the word law uh, uh, usually refers to in the Bible. Rather, there is another way you can translate this word. And that is as an operating principle, which I believe fits the context better here. So what Paul is saying is that justification is no longer based on the principle of, uh, of what you have done, but rather on the principle of who you believe in. 
Have you heard about the divorced lawyer who died and arrived in the gates of heaven? St. Peter asks him, So what have you done to merit entry into heaven? The lawyer thinks for a moment, I know, a week ago, I gave 50 cents to a homeless person on the street. St. Peter then asked the angel Gabriel um, to check the records to see whether this is really true. And after a while, Gabriel nods, confirming that, yes, that is the case. St. Peter then says, well, okay, that's fine. But it's, it's, but it's really not enough to uh, get you into heaven. The, the lawyer then replies, wait, 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 there's more. About three years ago, I gave another homeless person 50 cents. Once again, Gabriel nods to affirm that this was true. St. Peter then um, turns to Gabriel and whispers, so what do you think we should do with that fellow? Gabriel then uh, replies to St. Peter, how about we give him back his one dollar and tell him to go to hell? <laughs> if you were to reach the gates of heaven and Jesus will ask you, why should I let you into heaven? How would you reply? Will you say, oh, because I went to church, or I fed a few homeless people, or because uh, I did a few good deeds? If that is your answer, you are in for a shock when you get to heaven. Because the Bible says that no one can enter heaven by their own works or their own merit. Remember Romans chapter 3, verse 20? Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. Why? Because we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Isaiah chapter 64, verse 6 says, All our righteous acts are like filthy rags to God. What is a filthy rag? Well, it literally means a menstrual cloth. Today, we would know it as this, a period pad or tampon. Can you imagine presenting a blood-stained uh, period pad? Yuck! That is what our righteous deeds are like before God, like filthy rags. If you think that you are good enough to enter heaven or you are still trying to earn your way into heaven by your good works, may I implore you to think again. You don't want to get to heaven and then find out that you don't have an entry pass into heaven because all the good works that you thought were enough to get you uh, into heaven turned out to be just filthy rags before God. There is only one way you can get an entry pass into heaven, and that is by believing in His Son, Jesus Christ. Now, if you are already a Christian, my guess is that you already know all this. You already know that the only way to be saved is by believing in Jesus. And you may have, or, uh, 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 and you have probably prayed to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior multiple times. My question to you is do your thoughts, emotions, and behaviors uh, line up with what you believe? What do I mean by this? Well, what I mean is if you believe that only faith can make you acceptable to God, are you still trying to earn God's acceptance or favor by your good works? 
by what you do or don't do? Are there, do you at times fear that perhaps you will miss out on heaven because of something wrong that you've done? You see, it is possible to believe in Jesus and yet still be a legalistic Christian. A good example is the Galatian Christians, whom Paul rebukes in Galatians chapter 5. You who are trying to be justified by the law have been alienated from Christ. You have fallen away from grace. How did the Galatian Christians fall away from grace? By returning back to the law. Although they believed in Jesus, they were influenced by false teachers who insisted that they must be circumcised and still keep the Jewish rules and customs of the uh, Mosaic law. In other words, faith by itself is not enough. You must also, uh, uh, also supplement your faith by um, adding in good works in order to secure your place in heaven. But my dear friends, salvation doesn't work like that. You are either saved all by grace or all by the law. You can't have it both ways. It is either or. When Martin Luther translated the first copy of the Bible into uh, German, he added the word alone after faith when translating Verse 28, a person is justified by faith alone. The word alone, of course, is not found in the original text, but it certainly captures the sense of what Paul is saying here, doesn't it? Martin Luther wanted the German people to understand that if we are to be justified apart from the law, it must be by faith alone. And the moment you, you add in your own works or your uh, own deeds or righteousness, you destroy the meaning of grace. Because salvation becomes no longer a gift, but rather something that you've worked for. We will see this again next week when we look at the illustration of Abraham in chapter 4. So how do you know if you've become a legalistic Christian? Well, this is by no means an exhaustive checklist, but here are just a few questions for you to ask yourself. Do you ever feel God is angry with you or fear that God will not accept you into heaven? Do you lack joy in your life? Do you have a checklist of things that a Christian must do or uh, don't do in order to be saved? Do you see yourself as better than others? Do you have a tendency to judge others? If you answered yes to any of these questions, chances are you've become a legalist because it shows that you are measuring yourself and, and measuring others by the law, not by what Jesus has done. But if salvation is a gift of God, it leaves no room for legalism. Because you can't earn it by what you do. It is all by grace. This leads us to the third implication of the gospel. The gospel excludes segregation. It excludes segregation. There's been a lot of focus on racism and racial segregation in recent weeks, hasn't there? Um, Primarily because of the Black Lives Movement. What are these protesters fighting for? For equality, for black people to be treated on equal terms as white people. Racial discrimination, however, is not a recent problem. 
it's been around for as long as civili human civilization has existed. It was certainly around during Paul's day as well. The, the Jews, for example, saw themselves as uh, better than everyone else. The Jews divided all people into two groups. Group one, the Jews. Group two, the Gentiles, that is, everybody else. And if you were everybody else, I'm sorry, you can't be part of God's people because only the Jews were chosen by God. That is why the outermost area of the temple was called the court of the Gentiles, because that was the only area that the Gentiles could enter. They were excluded from entering the inside of the temple. That is why the Christian faith was so radical and so groundbreaking when it sprang up in the first century. Because for the first time, people were told that it doesn't matter what race or gender or social class that they belong to, they were all equal before God. There is no difference or distinction between people. We are all sinners saved by the grace of God. In verses 29 to 30, Paul says, Or is God the God of Jews only? That's a rhetorical question, by the way. The obvious answer is no. He's not just the God of Jews only. Is he not the God of Gentiles too? Yes, of Gentiles too. Since there is only one God who, is, who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through that same faith. Paul's basic argument here is that if God is not just the God of Jews only, but also um, the God of Gentiles, then there is no difference between Jews and Gentiles. They both belong to God. And both are made right with God on the same basis, through faith in Jesus Christ. God has evened out the playing field. The Jew is no better than the Gentile. The educated is no better than the uneducated. The rich is no better than the poor. The white collar professional is no better than the blue collar worker. That is why when John Wesley preached the gospel during the evangelical awakening of the 18th century, he offended many people of the high class with his preaching because he made it clear to them that if the gospel is true, then there is no distinction between them and the lower class. Do you want to see true equality? My dear friends, you won't find it through political activism or social reform because prejudice and bias is ingrained in all of us due to our fallen human nature. Only the gospel can bring about true equality. Only the gospel can break down the dividing barrier of uh, discrimination and hostility that separates people. Because when you gaze upon the blood that Jesus shed for you at the cross, it becomes crystal clear that we are no different to others. You know, we are all wretched sinners who have been saved by God's mercy. Unfortunately, this is one area that I admit the church has felt terribly at throughout its history. The medieval crusades, the religious wars between Protestants and Catholics in the 16th to 17th century, and the use of the Bible to justify slavery uh, from the 16th to 20th century, 
are just a few to name uh, to name. Did you know, for example, that Mahatma Gandhi almost became a Christian? Yes, it's true. When Gandhi was attending university uh, at London, he was impressed by the teachings of Jesus, and he was seriously con uh, considering of converting to Christianity. So one day he decided to visit a nearby church so that he could talk to the um, minister about becoming a Christian. But do you know what happened when he entered the church? An usher refused to give him a seat and told him to go worship with his own people. And Gandhi walked away from that church and never returned. If Christians have caste differences also, he said, I might as well remain a Hindu. How about us? Are there certain people that we exclude or avoid? Are there certain people that we discriminate or differentiate against? Are there some people that we assume God could never save? Or here is another one. Do we have our own version of a caste system? Do we see some Christians as more anointed or more holy or more favoured by God because perhaps uh, they preach well or, or have done a lot of amazing things or seem to be able to do more healings and miracles? Before the cross, however... We are all equal. We are all sinners who have been saved by nothing other than the grace of God. The gospel leaves no room for segregation. This leads us to the fourth implication of the gospel. It fulfills the law. It fulfills the law. Given how much Paul has been talking about the inability of the law to make us righteous, you can easily see how it could lead some to conclude that Paul is anti-law, that he thinks the law has become irrelevant. But is that what Paul is really trying to say? Is he saying that faith cancels out the law? To this, Paul replies in verse 31, Do we then nullify the law by this faith? Not at all. This is the strongest note possible in the Greek language, by the way. Not at all. Rather, we uphold the law. Here, the word uphold can also be translated to uh, establish or confirm. In other words, Rather than uh, cancelling out the law, faith actually establishes it. Instead of making the law redundant, it fulfills it. In what way, though? In what way does the gospel of justification by faith alone fulfill the law? Well, there are three possible ways depending on what sense of the law Paul is referring to here. If Paul is using the law to refer to the Old Testament in general, then justification by faith upholds the, rather than undermines the testimony of the Old Testament. Because the Old Testament has always taught that people are made right with God by faith. Paul will use the example of Abraham to further illustrate this point in chapter 4, which we will look at next week. So rather than undermine the Old Testament, the Gospel actually confirms it. But it is also true that, uh, it is also possible that Paul is using the law to refer specifically to the law of Moses. Uh, for example, the Ten Commandments. 
If that is the case, the law fulfills the law by accomplishing the very purpose for which the law was given. Because what is the purpose of the law? Not to make people righteous, but rather to condemn people, to expose their sin so that they recognize their need for Jesus. Romans chapter 3 verse 20. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of our sin. The law then was given to prepare people for the coming of Christ. And when we put our faith in Jesus, we fulfill the very function of the law. Another possibility is that Paul is responding to those who are falsely accusing him of encouraging disobedience. Some may say, well, if people are justified by faith apart from the law, then doesn't that mean that we, don't, we no longer need to obey the law? In theology, we call this antinomianism. Antinomianism means anti Law. It believes that the coming of Jesus Christ has made the Old Testament law irrelevant to Christians. You will find elements of antinomianism in some churches today, particularly those who only talk about grace and love. Steve Furtick, the pastor of Elevation Church, for example, said in one of his sermons, God broke the law for love. Now, I don't know whether Steve Furtick was just using a bit of hyperbole here, but his language does certainly give people the impression that the law has been abolished by the coming of Jesus Christ. But is that really true? Does justification by faith make the Old Testament law redundant? Do we no longer have to keep the Ten Commandments because we now live in the era of grace? Well, Jesus gives a clear answer to this in Matthew chapter 5. Do not think that I've come to abolish the law of the prophets. I've not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen, will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. So Jesus didn't come to break the law. He came to fulfill it. Having faith in Jesus doesn't mean that you can now just sweep all the demands of the law you know, under the carpet. No, the demands of the law still stand. To be right with God, you must keep all of his commandments. That has never changed. But the good news of Jesus is that Jesus has fulfilled the demands of the law on our behalf because we were unable to do it on our own. Not only that, the gospel liberates us from the power of sin so that we are finally able to live according to God's commands. Uh, I don't want to say too much more on this because uh, we will uh, to, uh, look more into this when Paul talks about this in chapter 8, where he says, And so he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us, who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. There are many who falsely assume that if the doctrine of justification by faith alone is true, that it gives people the free license to keep sinning uh, and, or, or do whatever they want to do. But that is not true at all. Because if you have genuinely put your faith in Jesus Christ, it should lead you to naturally want to live a life that pleases God. 
Actually, it is those who live by faith who are able to truly obey God, not those who live by the law. As Charles Spurgeon once said, if God gives you the grace to make you believe, He will give you the grace to live a holy life afterwards. So in verses 27 to 28, Paul excludes legalism. And in verse 31, Paul excludes antinomianism. And this uh, attention between uh, legalism and antinomianism is a constant uh, struggle that uh, Christians have experienced throughout their Christian life. And it's easy to sway too much to one side or the other if you do not have a firm understanding of what it means to be justified by faith alone. That is the reason why the Reformers saw the uh, doctrine of justification by faith alone as the cornerstone of Christianity. And they were willing to sacrifice their lives to preserve this important truth. When Martin Luther was uh, dragged before the, uh, the, the Council of the Catholic Church in 50, 1521 to stand trial for heresy, uh, his writings were all uh, laid out on the table. And he was asked, Martin Luther, are these your books? Intimidated by the setting, a setting, Martin Luther replied in a trembling, soft voice, Yes, those books are mine. Do you recant of these, uh, what you say in these books? On this second question, Luther hesitated. He asked to be given one night to think over how he would reply that question. And after a whole night of deliberating with his friends and praying, he came back the next day uh, and uh, to stand before the Catholic Council. And he made this great confession. How can I recant of my books? They are filled with the Word of God. To recant my books would be to recant the Word of God itself. My conscience is bound by the Word of God. I can do no other. Here I stand. God help me. And with this bold statement, the flame of the Protestant Reformation was lit in people's hearts and it spread like wildfire throughout the world. But this movement could have been easily snuffed out by the Catholic Church if Martin Luther did not make a stand for this important truth, that we are justified by faith alone. Why did Luther not compromise on this doctrine? Because he was fully aware what the deadly repercussions were if this truth was not upheld. He knew if people are not justified by faith alone, the entire gospel falls apart. Writing about Martin Luther, J.I. Packer says, Martin Luther described the doctrine of justification by faith as the article of faith that decides whether the church is standing or falling. By this he meant that when this doctrine is understood, believed, and preached, as it was in New Testament times, the church stands in the grace of God and is alive. But where it is neglected, overlaid, or denied, the church falls from grace and its life drains away, leaving it in a state of darkness and death. That was the state of the Catholic Church during Luther's time. It had become 
corrupt. The clergy uh, abuse their power and getting into heaven had become a lucrative money-making business through the sale of relics. All because the Catholic Church had departed from this central truth of the gospel that salvation is by faith alone. Instead, the Catholic Church taught that a mixture of faith and good works was necessary for salvation. And this led to countless souls ending up in hell because of this false teaching. How about you? Have you grasped the implications of the gospel? Justification by faith alone? Do you understand what this means for your life? Because if you do, it ought to make you humble because the gospel excludes boasting. It ought to bring you profound joy and an assurance of salvation because you know that you have been set free from the impossible demands of the law. It ought to make you more loving and accepting of others that may be different to you because the gospel removes all segregation and distinction between people. And it ought to make you a holier person. For it is the gospel that gives us the power to fulfill the law. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the gospel, for the good news of Jesus Christ. We thank you that at the cross, Jesus died for our sins so that our sins may be forgiven and we may receive the gift of eternal life. This is a gospel that many of us may have heard many times. But it's easy for us, uh, for, for this gospel to just remain in our heads and not sink in to our hearts. And so I pray today, O oh Lord, that we will not just know the good news of Jesus in theory, but that we may appreciate and understand the enormous implications that it has for our lives and that we will live according to the truth that we are justified by faith alone. Help us, O oh Lord, to not boast, to not be proud, but rather to be humble because we are saved not by our own works, or by our own righteousness, but by the grace of God. Help us, O oh Lord, to not be legalistic because the gospel has set us free from the demands of the law. Help us, O oh Lord, to not exclude or look down on others because the gospel has removed all distinctions between people and we are all equal before you. And help us, O oh Lord, to not break the law, but rather to uphold it because that is why you sent Jesus. You sent Jesus to fulfill the law. And I pray for all those who may not yet have 
put their faith in Jesus Christ, that today will be the day where you will open their eyes to see just how true and how wonderful this good news of Jesus Christ really is, and that they may put their faith in Him. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.